I'm super excited to share with you my newest book, 44, Derangements and the Shape of Persistence. In this guided reading, I'll be adding commentary and additional discussion to the book. To the joyous quest of personal thought and the transformation of new understanding. This book composes the most accurate, complete, and ontologically empowering story of physical reality that's ever been told. In short, in this book it is discovered that 1. The balance of the hyperbolic figure 8 knot decomposes into five actions with Planck constant boundaries, defining a single domain under five-part persistent action whose limits define the boundaries of time, space, charge, mass, and temperature. 2. The external facing boundaries of that balance connect via the hyperbolic vortex equation, partitioning the Planck charge and Planck mass boundaries into the exact charge and mass values that define the fundamental particles of matter. 3. Every unique boundary intersection within this minimum balance defines a constant of nature. 4. The Planck union is duly hyperbolic, structurally determined by the ideal hyperbolic connection, defined by E, the base of natural logarithms, and the ideal hyperbolic partition function, the gamma function. And five, the Riemann zeta function, the octonians, and calculus are defined by the combinatorics of this minimum partition balance. In summary, in this book we find that the simplest self-balanced geometry defines the minimal persistent arena, and the division parameters of that arena define the fundamental parameters of physical reality. Preface The Search The task is not to see what has never been seen before, but to think what has never been thought before about what you see every day. Erwin Schrodinger. In an early attempt to construct a story that accounts for reality's persistent physical properties, Plato advanced the idea that the elemental building blocks of geometry are also the elemental building blocks of reality, that the five elemental shapes constructible from faces with equal length sides, the platonic solids, are atoms of fire, air, earth, water, and ether, the primordial substance everything else was contained in. The reach of this idea triggered a categorical awakening, transforming what it meant to be conscious. Waking up to the idea that geometry plays a role in the construction of reality, makes it possible for us to walk ourselves out of the cave of ignorance. A geometry is something we can say more about, something we can investigate, measure, and define the internal logic of. The possession of this knowledge transforms its holder into someone capable of seeking greater clarity and finding it, someone capable of self-transformation. For the first couple of eons after Plato's geometric insight lit the caverns of consciousness, humanity's search for nature's implicitly obtainable logic, or answering the call of existence and making one's best attempt to make sense of things, meant studying the platonic solids. If you wanted to uncover the secrets of reality, you would spend your hours staring at these elemental shapes, trying to divine anything else they might have to say. After 2,000 years of intense focus, Leonard Euler came along and, with little more than a glance, noticed that all of the platonic solids are connected by a single elementary geometric relationship. Every one of them maintains the same balance of zero, one, and two-dimensional features, vertices, edges, and faces. That is, each shape's number of vertices, minus its number of edges, plus its number of faces, is always equal to 2. 
However obvious and simple this fact may now appear, the question that we must address is, how did everyone else miss it? Despite the intense interest in these geometric forms and the generations of people searching them for further clues, nobody had ever found what Euler found. Why? It doesn't take much time to count up the properties of these shapes and compare them. Yet nobody had. Why not? The answer is that before Euler, nobody had imagined that an object's number of sides was a feature worthy of attention. They had never seen anyone else care about such a feature, so it just hadn't occurred. Euler was the first to count up these features and compare them because he was the first to imagine the option. He woke us up to that concept, and many more, lifting the ceiling of what it means to think, and therefore to be. Conscious thinkers have only two routes to new thought, through example or through genuine new reaches of imagination. Just as it is usually easier to verify an answer than to find one, it is usually easier to follow a line of logic laid out for you than to lay one out for yourself, which is why conscious thinkers almost always follow. The trouble is that if we are always just following, then we can get seriously stuck, like as a whole. If nobody has ever shown us an example of being interested in the number of edges an object has, for example, we can all stare at something for 2,000 years without seeing what's right in front of our eyes. Euler looked into the world with new eyes, under his own investigation, instead of looking as he had been directed to. And as a consequence, the world inherited new conceptual powers. Another famous example of how difficult it can be to take the next logical step without anyone showing us how comes from our history of conceptualizing gravity. For millennia, humans personally pondered why things fall to the ground. But it wasn't until Galileo came along that anyone thought to measure how things fall under the influence of gravity. Galileo's measurements could be performed by nearly any human, within minutes, with no cost, like rolling a ball down an inclined plane and marking the ball's position at successive increments of time and then comparing the distance between those marks. But before Galileo, nobody had tried. Nobody had thought to. By extending the powers of measurement, to gravity, Galileo became the first to see it more clearly, famously finding that gravity's action depends on an inverse square law. In other words, he discovered that gravity is geometric. This fact about gravity had always been true. It had always been staring us in the face, screaming from every freefall occurrence ever witnessed. But nobody had seen it before because nobody thought of gravity as a thing to physically measure, a thing to look into that way. Through his efforts, Galileo came to one of the greatest insights of all time, that the truth about reality is right in front of our eyes. The task is to see it more clearly, to more explicitly conceive its true form. Philosophy is written in this grand book, The Universe, which stands continually open to our gaze. But the book cannot be understood unless one first learns to comprehend the language and read the letters in which it is composed. It is written in the language of mathematics, and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures without which it is humanly impossible to understand a single word of it. Without these, one wanders about in a dark labyrinth. Galileo Galilee. Today's best geometric description of the fundamental structure of reality is called quantum field theory. Correctly parameterized, this construction produces all of the actions of quantum mechanics and special relativity, a feat that earns it the title of being the pinnacle achievement of science. The problem is that although quantum field theory makes the right predictions, 
nobody understands why it has that particular construction. That is, the parameters of quantum field theory have no story themselves. Every single one of them remains utterly unexplained, known from experimental measurement only. In short, we cannot explain why quantum field theory is constructed as it is. We cannot predict its parameters to any degree of accuracy at all. But once we construct our field theory with those particular parameters, the actions of quantum mechanics and special relativity are reproduced in full. Look into nature, and then you will understand it better. Albert Einstein Today, any serious investigation of reality involves staring at the parameters of quantum field theory in search of the logic connecting them. That is, the modern version of the quest to tell the accurate story of reality's construction, now called the theory of everything, literally boils down to explaining the parameters of quantum field theory, explaining why they are what they are. And, of course, here they are, the parameters of quantum field theory, the constructive parameters of our existence. Defining the electron mass, the proton mass, the neutron mass, all the way down, all 17. Note that the three neutrino masses are unknown at this point. We know they're, without, they're above zero, so they have some positive value, and we know a top limit for their sum, or their combined value, but we don't know uh, even the first digit or power of these numbers yet. The fine structure constant, everyone's uh, favorite physics mystery, right? A number like pi, a dimensionless number that's geometrically written into the central structure of quantum mechanics, of quantum field theory. It's written into the construction of an electron, into the construction of all of chemistry. It's central, just as pi is central as circles. And yet, we only know it from measurement, out to this accuracy, and we have no geometric story connect that connects yet to it, right? Of course, this book changes that, but I was just trying to catch up to where we're at in the story. Um, the electron charge, fundamental parameter of existence, the Compton wavelength, all the way down, to recognize the speed of light. And let's note in here that the value we are listing is uh, the updated Fermilab value for the mu and g factor. Right? It's been recently updated compared to the rest of these. So this list is the list of the parameters of existence. And the numbers with the highest accuracy, with the highest precision, or the most number of digits in them, represent the most precise measurements we have ever made in science of any kind. The greatest possible measurement reaches all the way out to 14 significant digits in all of science. And that's here, this list. Just so everyone's really centered on, on where we're going in this book. This book tells the story of these numbers, revealing that all the actions of quantum field theory and general relativity are mapped by the combinatorial logic of the minimal self-balanced manifold, the hyperbolic figure eight knot. That is, in this book, we notice for the first time that the ideal minimum geometry, the one that defines the minimum possible self-persistent stage, is responsible for setting the stage of physical reality and for giving it all of its constructive parameters. The layout of this book is as follows. In chapters 0 through 4, we fully decompose the hyperbolic figure 8 knot, under ideal partition balance. In chapter 5, we discover that the boundary conditions of this decomposition precisely predict the Planck constants, the mysterious limits or boundaries of the five fundamental dimensions of measure in physics, time, space, charge, mass, and temperature. In chapter 6 through 9, we observe that the external facing boundaries of that balance connect under hyperbolic vortex arrangement, and that this connection precisely partitions the Planck charge and the Planck mass boundaries into the charge and mass assignments that define the fundamental particles of matter, predicting all of their values geometrically. In chapter 10, 
we find that the unique Planck intersections balanced by this minimally partitioned geometry define the constants of nature. In chapters 11 through 12, we notice that the Planck union is duly hyperbolic, that is, the Planck boundaries are maintained under ideal hyperbolic connection, defined by E, the base of natural logarithms, and they terminally partition in the ideal hyperbolic way, defined by the gamma function. And in chapters 13 through 15, we discover that the Riemann zeta function, the octonians, and the logic of calculus are the unique combinatorial features of this minimum partition balance. In summary, the unique properties of the minimal self-balanced geometry elegantly define the constructive parameters of reality. As in the impossible to predict parameters of the heart of physics, the unexplained missing soul of our best current story of reality structure. The balance created by the division boundary of the hyperbolic figure eight knot defines the minimal arena of persistence. The geometry of that simplest self-balance defines the shape of reality, and the division parameters of that shape define the fundamental properties of physics. Chapter Zero The Simplest Manifold In the mid-1970s, Robert Riley and Charles Jorgensen independently discovered that the figure eight knot emits a complement with a hyperbolic structure. This was the first known example of a hyperbolic knot, a closed boundary formed under hyperbolic balance. As this is our first introduction to this basic shape, first thing to notice is the cutouts in this image are not part of the geometry. That's so that we can see the inside. So when we're talking about the shape, fill in the cutouts symmetrically. It's pretty easy to see what, that, what I mean by that. Um, and that's the boundary. That's the two-dimensional boundary we're talking about. Also, it doesn't have any thickness. It's a, it's a two-dimensional surface. We have it here for thickness as a, you know, easier to see. <laughs> So to imagine the actual shape, imagine this two-dimensional surface with no thickness uh, in this in this form, but fill in the gaps between the form. And you'll see that when this shape is maintained, or when this shape is made, you've divided now, and when you fill in the gaps, you've partitioned off an internal domain and an external domain. That's an important thing to see. So imagine if this was... Um, if you were to put some dye and, and trace out the path of fluid, and you were to make waves such that they intersected and carved this boundary as their intersection, then that would be a permanent boundary divisor, and everything inside, whatever color was inside, would stay inside, whatever color was outside would stay outside. This image, by the way, is a rendition extended originally from Henry Siegerman's beautiful original STL work that he's got on Thingsverse. A link in the intro page here. Beautiful, beautiful work. The complement of the hyperbolic figure eight knot portrayed here with cutouts to allow visibility is the finite volume bounded by the simple closed geodesics that trace out the figure eight knot. If you imagine being a small ant walking along the surface and you're trying to go through the neck and come back out to where you started in the shortest path, every, every point you could have started on the surface and then do that fills out or traces out the entire surface, right? The, uh, the point is, no matter where you're on the surface, if you were to then trace out the shortest path through and back to yourself, you'd be following a loop that traced out a figure eight before you got back to yourself. The hyperbolic figure eight knot is a double cover of the Gieskein manifold, the simplest among all non-compact hyperbolic three manifolds. Its internal volume complement, which is equal to twice the Gieskein's constant, defines the smallest possible volume complement, and it's equal to 2.02988321281930 and on and on and on. It's a geometric number like pi. A manifold is a geometry that itself closes, one whose boundary has been removed. For example, to transform a rectangle, a two-dimensional geometric form, into a manifold, 
We fold it around on itself in one way to form a cylinder, removing two of the boundaries by connecting them. Then we twist that tube into a closed torus by connecting the ends of a cylinder, removing the remaining boundaries. And when all the boundaries are gone, it's now a two-dimensional surface that's closed. So you could be an ant and every direction you walked would be fine. You would never fall off the edge, right? You would just keep walking along the surface. So it's now a manifold. And that's a two-dimensional example of this. Now, what we're going to be doing is, is moving up to a higher dimensional representation of a manifold. So a closed system where all the geometry leaves you no open edge, no gaps in the system. So every rotation closes against every other. This minimally persistent balance separates a finite domain. It's not infinite, right? It separates a finite domain into two finite regions of momentum. A volume whirling about inside the complement division boundary and a finite volume outside that boundary moving under mirrored action. Together, the internal and external actions of this balance define the minimal persistent geometry, or universe. This minimal self-balance stage defines the simplest possible perpetual balance of boundary conditions. That is to say, persistence is minimally obtained when a filament, a finite wave element, becomes balanced under local cyclic action by dividing over the division boundary of the hyperbolic figure 8 knot, the minimal persistent geometry. When William Thurston looked at this ideal geometry, he discovered that its internal complement decomposes into a union of two regular ideal hyperbolic tetrahedra. He then famously formulated his geometrization conjecture, claiming that all three manifolds admit a certain kind of geometric decomposition involving eight geometries, most of which are hyperbolic. Gregory Perlman proved this conjecture in 2002-2003. Thurston's decomposition was a brilliant addition to our knowledge of the hyperbolic figure eight knot, but it didn't tell us everything there is to know. That is, it wasn't explicit enough to define every feature of this minimum geometry. For a complete understanding of the hyperbolic figure eight knot's geometric properties, to sharply define its internal and external projections, its boundary conditions, and the balance of intersections maintained by those boundaries, we need to explicitly decompose its full partition balance, internally and externally. Let's begin by generally decomposing this geometry into its five unique balances. Note, the internal and external geometries of this balanced system are maintained under Mobius connection. That is, the same circles connect into two different internal and external constructive geometries. In the figures that follow, to make the internal-external partition balance easier to compare, I have connected the circles in both ways into their internal and external geometric expressions, and placed them side by side. So I hope to make that super clear up front. We're trying to represent visually the partition balance of this system, but there's an internal and external in intrinsic nature of this system. So to visually represent that the partition, the partitionness of it. I have put the inside construction and the external construction side by side. The geometry on the left shows what the division boundary looks like to an internal observer inside the minimum volume complement or the hyperbolic figure eight not complement boundary. So if you're inside that domain, then the edge of the universe to you is in the shape of the hyperbolic figure eight knot. And that's as far out as you ever can see. There's, no, there's nothing beyond that. While the geometry on the right shows what the division boundary looks like from the point of view of an observer within the external domain, the N hypersphere of maximal volume. Chapter 1. The Minimum Partition Balance the action of the hyperbolic figure eight knot is five-dimensional. It decomposes into five unique geometrically balanced actions. We're going to label them balance zero, one, two, three, and four. Here in the figure, you can see balance zero and one. They belong to the internal construction of this geometry. We've put them on the left. And this is supposed to represent the hyperbolic figure eight knot, or a cartoon partitioning of the hyperbolic figure eight knot boundary you've seen already. 
And on the right, we see the external construction of those boundaries forming entirely within balance four, so in the purple domain. In this construction, there's a, a minimum scale, a smallest thing, the internal smallest piece. And there's a, a largest thing, the external limit of the domain. The partition balance of the hyperbolic figure eight knot balances two internal actions, balance zero and one, against three unique external actions, balances two and four. Why is it two against three? It's really two on two in internally against two by two externally. And the two, the R4 expression of that externally collapses quickly to an R3 expression because the two circles are not the same scale in size. This is also very clearly should, should point out that this decomposition is a cartoon decomposition of different actions. And I've put them all as circles here because they're all completely different scales. So they're roughly circles compared to each other, but they have different size. I had to squeeze the whole universe into the purple skies, right, into the picture. And the smallest size, all the way down to the Planck time boundary, down in the left picture in the, the purple, or sorry, in the, in the blue circles. So the, in all the scales here is a logarithmic expression in, in this representation of how we're breaking these things apart, breaking the action apart, right? We have a giant scale, the whole universe, to this. we have the largest and smallest scales of the universe on, this, on the one picture. So please keep in mind this is a cartoon, but also a logarithmic representation you should be imagining here. All right, we're taking this picture, this decomposition structure, where it's really super symmetric, closed on itself, right, under the structure of the minimum manifold, so the hyperbolic figure eight knot. This general decomposition now, we can break into its five balances. So are those five different boundaries of balance, five different scales, which is going to be a balance, and two internal, three external unique ones. And when we write this down, we can just stack them on top of each other. So starting from balance zero and balance one, those are on the internal domain. Balance two, three, and four define the external domain. And notice that balance four leaves us at the center balanced point of this projection, the one, the, the, the projection. So this is the unitary projection of the entire balance. Everything else decomposes compared to it, right? So everything in this balance agrees that's the one, that's the projected point, because it's a balance. All right, so balance four just is equal to one, and the rest of these decompose the one. That means that its boundaries are what we put set as in balance with the other balances. So boundary four and boundary inverse four, note, are going to be the same thing operationally, but inverses. So mathematically, they're the same. So they won't be unique. The rotation D4 inverse is literally just the inverse rotation, the inverse power. So we have five unique equations here that we need to solve now for, but we have our structure laid out. We have two internal balances, we have three external balances, and every one of those balances is going to have some sort of inner action that represents it, something it's doing geometrically to maintain the balance, and an outer rotation, just a simple rotation that maintains the balance line. So it can be very complex on the inside, but if a balance is reached, then as we go along the balance line that is reached, then externally there will be a rotation that counters the balance, because this is a many-part system. So along any single balance line, there will have to be an inside and an outside, and the outside will be an external rotation that's a smooth, simple rotation. The inner one depends on which one we're on. But it's going to be a hyperbolic division of something, right? We're going to divide up the world in the simplest possible hyperbolic way to divide things up. 
So we're going to define all those as we go, but right now we're trying to connect the picture to our mathematical construction where we're dividing this thing up into its internal and external parts. Valence 0 and 1 are its internal parts. Valence 2, 3, and 4 are its external parts. And we have a symmetry that connects those two together. But then we're breaking this into pieces, so now we can try to solve for its, say, interaction on each level, and its outer rotation on each level, and so on. Okay, the union of balance 0 here and balance 1 define the internal double cover domain, right? And balance 4, created by the union of balance 2 and 3, defines the external split cover domain. And d sub k is equal to the number of derangements involved in each balance. So this whole system is now going to be a derangement balance. We're going to have things that partition, but anything that moves, any action or rotation or geometric um, distortion made has to be countered exactly somewhere else, or a collection of else's, right? But in total, in this system, if one partition happens, it must be closed collectively somewhere else. Let's also remember that the balance point of the external domain, so this external projection of the whole hyperbolic figure eight knot balance, once this minimum universe is formed, the projected balance point prescribes the unitary scale of this decomposition. It, it literally defines the one, the scale of stability projected under the five-part action. So under this ideal inversion, balances two and four are the mirrored Mobius actions of balances zero and one. The combined action of balance two and three, the blue and red arrows, rotates the external domain under balance four. So it, the, the presence of the rotation of our blue circle externally and our red circle externally, because they are rotating, that leaves the external main under a combined rotation of the purple. Right now we have this general picture in our head that there's a way that things in the minimal balance decompose, and it's, it's different as it goes through the scales, but collectively that it decomposes in a way such that there's an internal and external domain that never mix. So under this minimal geometric balance, they form the hyperbolic figure eight knot boundary from the internal perspective. That same, the same components that form that boundary from the external perspective look different. In fact, they project, so there's a, there's a action still left over on the outside of the blue and red boundaries externally. And that action is projectively external, so it goes out, out, out. So there's action of motion, you think of a fluid rotation or motion that projective action has a limit that it makes it to. So that limit defines the entire purple domain, the, the leftover action after the internal blue and red actions and the external blue and red actions have played their part. That central scale projection is the central projection of the entire balance. It's, it, it lives in the external domain. That's where it always lives. It is the one of this minimal reference system. So it defines what this system is projecting. It's the balance point of all the action here. So this action creates a domain in which there is a balance scale, a scale of balance, a scale in which the domain appears quiet and balanced. And that scale happens to define the one of the system because it's where things are not partitioning and it's where they are all most quietly rotating. Under this general decomposition now, we're going to be a little more specific and just write out the five different balances. Balance zero and one are going to be down at the bottom in the internal construction. Balance two, three, and four are external. But balance four defines the unitary projection of this entire construction. So it's just literally the one. So we have a very clear picture from here on out in the discussion. Anything that's based on the geometry we're talking about here has a one. And it has a way that the one is internally deconstructed. That's what we're defining actually now. We're defining this minimal system of, well, because it's the minimal system, we're gonna call it the unitary system of decomposition. And so that one unitary system is what we mean when we reference the external reference, it's one of the entire system. Okay, well, now we're, now we're more, we can get a little more specific 
by noting that on every balance line, so if there's these five different sized partitions happening in this minimal geometric balance, and it's all closed, there's no gaps in the rotations, but it takes all five to make sure that that stays closed, right? If that's the minimal construction we're going on, we can get more specific by noting that on the inside of every balance line, there can be a complex action. There can be things being divided and twisted and rotated. Lots of stuff can be happening, but if there's a balance line being formed at some point, then at the balance line, the external expression of that balance will be the simple possible rotation, some magnitude of rotation balancing the line. So the external expression will always be a simple rotation and we have to solve for the magnitude. But in every case, it's just going to be the simplest possible balance against. The internal construction in which it's, that simple rotation is balancing against can be more complex and we'll solve for what's the simplest possible state. But the outer rotation in every case of this decomposition balance will just be the simple rotation against that balance line, which means we will be able to update this structure and make it more specific. And remember why do we care about understanding this system so specifically? Why do we want to know the details of this minimum geometric balance? Well, it defines the ideal geometric stage. It gives us something to then build from, say, if you wanted to understand how a universe can come into existence. How about understanding the simplest possible manifold, right? A three-dimensional construction that's self-stabilized, it's closed, it involves more than three dimensions, obviously. It has to close in more than three dimensions. Here, we've got the minimal one defining as a five-dimensional system. In all of this construction, we're trying to assume the minimal possible geometric balance, the minimal possible hyperbolic constructive balance, defining the minimal hyperbolic balance. So we're setting this up as an asymmetric construction, at balance zero at the bottom, or internal, right? And balance one also internal. And then we have these colored bands that give us the division boundary between internal and external. And both of those bands are actually connected. They're, they're part of the same boundary. Okay. And balance two, three, and four live in that domain, in that external domain. All right, let's move on and make this even more specific. So we're, we're setting up a deranged structured balance here, how the one deranges or how the one decomposes internally of this projection, okay? All right, let's add some more details. Since this balance defines a finite localized action, so it's not infinite, it's finite, and it's localized, there's an internal part, there's internal parts moving all about, and there's some maximum boundary in which there's no longer any action at all playing any role. So it's finite, and it's localized, self-closed, Okay. Therefore, the rotations of its internal and external parts must perfectly close. The combination of those two, the internal and external parts of those rotations, by definition, perfectly close. Under ideal internal split factorization, which is also what we're adopting for our definition, right? We, everything's going to be ideal here. If it's internally factorizing ideally, meaning it's as things factor, they go in and they come out, and there's a cycle that everything is just completely balanced in this factorization cycle. Well, then internally, the derangements themselves are arranged, importantly, such that the square root of their difference is maintained. So internally, the derangements are maintained constructively so that the square root of their difference is always what's set. Externally, that projection, since it's a split cover now, inversely, it'll be not a square of that, but also a double. So we take the same thing externally and we square and double it in order to balance against the entire internal construction. So externally, if we only had one projection then that would be the end of the story. We would just now take the square of the internal arrangement and the double of that and say that's what we have. But what we really need is before we take the square, we have to, we have to add a phase. And zero could be one of the phases. So what we were saying before is one of the options, but it's only one of three options. So we're going to have the external partitions now close as doubled and squared arrangements. This has to, so they mirror and close the internal ideal arrangement, right? 
Um, so the doubled and squared arrangements of those internal factorizations, so two times the internal factorizations plus a phase squared, that's going to be the, the entire construction for all of them, and that external arrangement comes in three phases, which is k. So k could be minus 1 or 0 or plus 1. So when we plug in minus 1, 0, and plus 1 into our little equation for how the external derangements must balance to close against the internal derangements, we get three projected different numbers. These numbers define the derangements of each balanced level. The number of derangements that are playing a role in each level of the action. So at the very, very bottom, the full set of derangements. What defines the full set of derangement? Note, it's the derangements of five things is the definition. So the full set of derangements in our balance are at the bottom boundary. And internally, there's one other scale playing a role. There's not just one scale, there's two scales. There's two balanced actions playing a role. And the derangements of the second scale aren't the full set. It can't be. It's, if they're all scale asymmetric, they has to, have to be unique numbers. But they also know it have to be whole numbers. Right? This is a derangement set. It's a partitioned balance of a finite set of things. And so there's finiteness in this, but there's infinite connection in it. We'll now have a derangement structure that just depends on how many rotations are in your system. If n is 5, then the derangements are 44. Well, okay, so we're, how, if we have 5 rotations, we multiply that then just by the break in scale symmetry between the first scale of this action, of the derangement balance itself, and the second scale, its second expression. Since it's its second expression, it has to be under its balance. It has to be under harmonic form with it, right? So it's going to just be directly dependent on the break and scale symmetry of that construction. So if you know what kind of construction, you can define what the B would be. It's, it's seven. Once you know that, all, th all of the external expressions become uniquely set and you then can see the symmetry between their differences. So in this construction, this internal and external derangement construction, in which we're ideally internally dividing and externally closing against that division, ideally. Under this arrangement, we have our n equaling 5, the number of unique rotations partitioning the balance of the hyperbolic figure 8 knot. And we have the derangements of 5 equal 44, the number of derangements available to 5 rotations. And our b is equal to 7, the break and scale symmetry between the first and second balance scales maintained under this action. And in chapter 3, we get more into that. And the three external phases, so our negative 1, our 0, and our 1, those define the three surfaces of hyperbolic geometry encoded by the quadratic form x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals k. k is our phase set. The three external surfaces of hyperbolic geometry. When k is plus 1, it defines the one-sheeted hyperboloid on the left. When k is 0, it defines the null cone, the conic division boundary of the projective plane. And note, this is on the left and on the right. It's inside the one-sheeted hyperboloid on the left, and it's outside the two-sheeted hyperboloid on the right. But it's the division boundary between the two of them, the limit of its constructive split. External domain that's always maintained under this hyperbolic balance is the clue we've been missing all along, right? The, the comprehension or the piece of the puzzle that was missing is an understanding of a geometry that's responsible for what we see. And here, we intrinsically have a geometry that defines what we see, the external hyperbolic connection of physics of space-time. This minimum symmetry constraint being maintained under finite closed rotation via split symmetric division, under closed external quadratic connection, allows us to completely specify the right-hand side of the hyperbolic figure eight knots decomposition map. To sharpen this map further, we note that no matter how complex the interior action of a particular balance is, its exterior expression will always be just a smooth rotation of some magnitude. In other words, every outer rotation will be equal to e to some magnitude.
All right, great. So now our decomposition map of the hyperbolic figure eight knot is a lot more specific. We're able to fill in all the information on the right-hand side of the equals, so we know the decomposition structure of the internal and external expressions of this minimal balance. And on the left-hand side, we were able to collapse all the outer rotations into just mathematical expressions of just smooth rotations. In every case now, if we can solve for the interaction that makes up this decomposition balance, or the geometric action that's responsible for each geometric balance, then we will be able to identify the outer rotation or the magnitude of the outer rotation that maintains that action. So what we really need is to understand the balanced set of interactions, right? Where our rotation sub zero and one and two and three and four are the magnitudes of rotation keeping each external balance. And k is a number from the set of 0, 1, 2, and 3, and 4. So it's important to remember this entire construction is predicated on a balance, a partition balance, that has five fundamentally important things, five unique things in it. And in this constructive balance, the union of balance 0 and balance 1 to find the internal double cover domain, the internal complement. But balance four, created by the union of balance two and balance three, and it defines the external split cover domain, which is the n hypersphere of maximal volume. Real quick note, the internal partitioning defines the minimal partition volume, and the external expression defines the n hypersphere of maximal volume. To complete this decomposition map, we must specify its balance of interactions. Let's begin by defining the absolute minimum cyclic expression, balance zero. Chapter two, the minimum limit of persistence. Let the minimum balance in the hyperbolic figure eight knot, so balance zero, define the complete derangement, remember that's how we're defining it, so it's going to be derangement of the five unique rotations. So if n is equal to five, then uh, we're going to let balance zero be the definition of the derangements of those five things. And now we want to define the geometry of this minimum cyclic action. And how, how are we going to pick this geometry? Well, of course, we're going to define it as the minimum possible cyclic action, a circularly closed action, pi r squared trivially balanced against an external counter rotation. So the internal construction of this minimum balance was a circle. So we're putting in a circle as our minimum possible cyclic construction of our, in, our internal construction. So our balance zero, we're saying, is the simplest possible thing geometrically it could be, just a minimum circle. And it has an external balance maintaining it because it's not just a one part, two part system, it's a many part system. So under this balance, that minimum geometry has a balance that maintains it. So we can now solve, well, actually, no, in this equation, we can't solve because we don't know the r, we don't know the radius, right? So here in our, in our construction so far, we've defined balance zero as just being that pi r squared times the external rotation that's maintaining it. And that's defining the geometry of our derangements where red n is equal to five, the number of unique rotations partitioning this balance, and our derangements of those five things define the whole 44 derangements available to those five rotations. And rotation zero is the magnitude of the external rotation balancing this minimum cyclic action. To represent this minimum circle being maintained under hyperbolic construction, what would you do? How would, you, how would you define the radius of this circle if you wanted to define the radius of the circle as being maintained as ideally hyperbolic? It means that it's going to factor into rotations that counterbalance. So it's splitting on the inside, and that splitting factors into pieces that counterbalance under ideal complex division. This means they're splitting into equal but opposite internal rotations. Okay, each absorbing half the input, that's half is what makes it ideal. So this split is ideally arranged. And why do we need it to be ideal? Well, it's needed to be symmetric, at least it's square symmetric. It's pi r squared, so our radius is going to be squared. So whatever radial construction we put in place must be squarely present. 
It just means that we're just going to simply set the radius, r, equal to the hyperbolic sine. We're defining our radius as being hyperbolic and under ideal split balance. So it's hyperbolically constructed, so it's constructed under ideal split balance. Now all we have to do is decide what the actual constructive parameter of the argument is going to be. What's the hyperbolic sine, if it's the radius, what's it doing? It's splitting. And it's splitting squarely, okay? And so it's a square split division internally encoded here. So we're going to set the argument of this function. So we put the x in our hyperbolic sine equal to the minimal representation of square split division. Square split division just means one half that's split and square it, right? So this is a number that constructively possesses complex fourfold symmetry. And think of that. I'm not just I'm not going to write it down as one fourth because I want you to remember there's the squaring constructively in here in the one fourth. It's a square splitting. Keep in mind here now we have a argument that's based on a fourfold symmetry operator. So one half squared is equal to negative one half squared. So you could you could say it's either, or you could say it's negative one half i squared, or negative negative one half i squared. I'm just going to stick with the one half squared. The thing I want you to keep track of there is that the operation at the bottom is symmetric, it has a fourfold symmetry in the splitting that we're talking about. Okay, built in from the get go. All right, plugging this r into our equation we arrive at a precise characterization of the minimum cyclic limit of persistence. The smallest cyclic action maintained by the square split division balance of the hyperbolic figure eight knot. A derangement is a combinatorial permutation that has no fixed points. That is, it is a balanced rearrangement whose parts all play active roles. Nobody holds still. So there's a, a closed system where everybody, every part that's playing a role in the system is doing something. All right, so now that we've characterized the geometry of this minimal derangement structure, now we can characterize balance zero explicitly, and we get this equation, where a rotation zero now can be defined explicitly to any significant digit you want as 5.3912583683213 Three two three one three on and on and on, and this defines the magnitude of the external rotation maintaining balance zero. So we can now identify specifically the exact geometric external expression of this balance. Since this equation defines the minimum cyclic action within the minimum self-balanced geometry, right? This is the minimum action within the minimum self-balanced geometry. Therefore, it holds the honor of defining the ultimate boundary condition, the absolute minimum limit of measure, beyond which the possibility of persistence itself is operationally cut off. In other words, this equation defines the minimum boundary of time. Graph 1 shows the real on the left and imaginary on the right plots of the internal action of balance zero under inverse complex argument. So take the internal part, everything left of the E on, balance, on the equation for balance zero, and put in with the argument a inverse complex argument. The complex is x plus iy. So 1 over x plus iy into the argument there and plot it. Or you can do the, just the complex argument instead of the inverse complex argument and get graph 2. These are two constructive graphs of balance zero the minimum partition balance in the unit partition balance, the smallest possible division geometrically allowed. So we can also write balance zero in these other three ways. These are, I, these are equivalent expressions for the minimum limit of persistence. And this gives us a real good way to intuitively look at the built-in symmetries of this constructive division, this minimal hyperbolically constructive split. Chapter three, the first consequence. Under circular construction, so since we've defined our first uh, balance as being a minimal derangement with whose geometry is circular, 
Now, the constructive um, build of the world will be under circular construction, at least from there to the next balance, right? We're going to be able to say, what are you, what are you constructing the world from? Circles, because that's what our minimum piece of the world is, right? So under circular construction, the next size circle that can be constructed is always composed of seven circles, six outer circles surrounding one inner circle, right? We have a little figure here showing that. This is just a geometric rule for circles. If you have a unit circle, you have a bunch of unit circles, you can kiss six circles around one center circle and they're all barely perfectly kiss. Therefore, the break in scale symmetry between the first and second scales of any circular construction is going to be seven. To help follow what why we care so much about this, we're saying we have a geometry whose on its most elementary bottom level is constructively dividing into circles. So if we're going to be building another balance that needs to partially close against the action of those circles, that balance, of course, needs to be constructed of the only thing it could be emergent from is those circles. So since we know we're under a balance, a circular balance, the minimum circular balance you can achieve beyond the first is one that is composed now of seven of those circles instead of one. And that achievement gives you a second scaled circle. So now you have a second scale composed from the first scale. And since the first scale was a circular geometric construction, the second scale will be composed of seven of those. With this initial constructive arrangement in mind, let's zoom out to the next balance of the hyperbolic figure eight knot, balance one whose inner action is the operationally rotated inverse action of balance zero, right? It's constructed from it. So it's going to be the operationally rotated inverse action of it, of balance zero, adjusted for the break and scale symmetry, of course, between the two balances. This balance maintains a new external rotation, rotation one, that rotates or cycles through B times n, or 7 times 5, 35 of the fundamental 44 derangements. So now here's our equation. We have the inverse hyperbolic sine of the hyperbolic sine of 1 over our break and scale symmetry. That's our internal split constructive balance that's being projectively maintained in perfect balance with the internal balance that we've already got set. And the derangements of that balance are b times n. And this, since we know what b and n are, we can then easily solve for the value of the external rotation maintaining this second balance, this balance 1. So when we solve now for the value of rotation 1, we get 1.616259181756455, on and on and on. So in a way, how, this is a new geometric number that's characterizing one of the scaled actions in our balance, the scaled action of balance one in our balance. So now we have two geometric numbers characterizing the external projective rotations of our entire, of our entire five part system. Great, we're two out of five. And the entire construction we're talking about here is hyperbolically defined. Okay, it's hyperbolically dividing, it's hyperbolically balancing. It's literally the minimum hyperbolic construction we can set up requiring that that construction is self-closed. In graph three, we see the real on the left and imaginary on the right plots of the internal action of balance one under complex argument. So we put the, take the equation for balance one, put it in Wolfram Alpha, and in the argument, in the place for the argument, type in complex argument. Just give it a complex argument and hit plot. Yeah, tell it to plot it. Or, inversely, you could give it the um, inverse complex argument. And if you zoom into the right scale, you're going to get this division plot. I think the graphs are a great way to start um, building an intuition of what's being expressed. Another built-in symmetry here can be found from the fact that the five unique partitions of this geometric balance trivially connect under square arrangements and 
orthogonally factoring under ideal hyperbolic balance, meaning the following two equations trivially define a hyperbolically constructive logarithmic arrangement between the break and scale symmetry of our system and the rotations of the system, giving us in one case the rotations being squarely bound, they're arranged under square association, but orthogonally at the same time, so it is also true that those five rotations are hyperbolically ideally factoring. They're ideally hyperbolically factoring. They're, the gamma of those five rotations is orthogonally true to the square of those rotations. All right, that's a, a beautiful um, built-in. It's, it's so simply centrally there, it might be easy to forget. But remember, we have this constructive split, this hyperbolic split balance that we're defining. It's literally the ideal one. Chapter 4, The External Balances The external domain of the hyperbolic figure 8 naught connects under ideal hyperbolic vortex arrangement. In Chapter 6, we're going to really dial in on that, but um, for now, let's, let's introduce what we mean by this. Look at the picture. You can kind of forget now about everything in the back in this picture, everything inside that white circle, which is trying to represent the internal construction of this thing. So forget the internal construction for a second. Just think of the external domain. It's an external sphere projection in that, with the size of that um, purple radius. Okay? And the internal boundary of this sphere that's responsible for the sphere's existence to begin with is defined by the connection between that red and blue circle in the um, external domain. The, the circle is defining the vortex throat and the vortex closure. Okay, so the projected external domain has an internal constructive boundary, a boundary that's responsible for everything outside of it existing, but the shape of that boundary is made of parts that are asymmetric and chirally connected. All right, one of those then, since they're different, they can be distinguished, one of those we're going to label the throat, the smallest one, and the larger one we're going to call the closure, okay? But they're connected chirally, so there is a boundary that is going to be, have a geometric shape defining that connection, and these are the two constructive limits of that boundary. Think of like a, a torus has two circles in it, right? There's two limits of the constructively composed, the, to the total surface of the boundary. All right, so far here I'm just showing you the, the partitions, the pieces that get partitioned, but when you put them in action, you're going to trace out surfaces that these things close and form. So the boundaries of the two external balances, balances two and three, form the vortex's throat and its terminal limit. That's the takeaway here. And these are the blue and red circles within the external purple domain. Okay, so they form, if you're in the external domain, say you're at the scale of the purple dot, the center of the external domain at the, at the balance projected scale, and you're looking around at this constructive reality and you happen to look internally, look in at smaller and smaller scales, there is a, a, a limit in which you can cross the red boundary and another limit which you cross the blue boundary, but the, the range from the red to the blue boundary has a connection between it, a geometry that connects it. Until you hit that limit, everything just looks like it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. But when you do hit the first red limit, the domain you're describing is no longer just this projected sphere. You've literally abandoned the domain of the projected sphere. Now you're crossed a boundary in which you're not in the domain of the projected sphere. Now you're in a twisted domain that's an R4. It's a it's a it's two circles simply connected. So it's an R4 connection, but they're one of them is much 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 smaller than the other and forced to remain bound chirally to the other. So since they're under fixed chiral connection and one of them is many orders smaller than the other, they're asymmetric in scale by far, then that means that the smallest circle is going to wind up or limit the, the freedom of the larger circle, giving it only one more dimension of freedom for its projection. So now we have a circle and then a third projection projects out to a sphere. We have a, a circle that projects externally all the way out into a sphere, right? An internal circle boundary that is externally projected out into a sphere, but the edge of that sphere doesn't count as part of its shape. The actual boundary itself on the edge of the sphere, the purple boundary, the purple sphere, is you have to delete because that's the 
that's the missing, that's the closed boundary. That's the boundary in which the action is no longer, that's the first place in which action no longer is participating in the balance of the hyperbolic figure eight knot, right? That's the, that's the limit, the first point in which no action plays a role. And since this is a derangement balance that doesn't get to be in the system, it's not included in the system. And also this is why we define this projective geometry as a manifold. Right? Because the, it doesn't have the boundary. It's a shape, it's a form geometrically maintained that's spherical in its projection. But because it's projected from the inside out, the surface at the end isn't the interesting place where things are going on. That's the most boring place of the entire geometry. It's quiet. In fact, at the very boundary itself, it's not part of the geometry. It's just, it's just the background noise, whatever geometry there might be. There's nothing interesting uh, uh, at the boundary itself, but just inside the boundary, things are now under action. Okay, let's do a little more detail. We're going to define the vortex's throat and the vortex's closure. So first, balance two forms the vortex's throat, defining where the n unique partitions doubly periodically divide, which we can represent the Weierstrass constant, W sub WE while factoring along the break and scale symmetry of the geometry. Break and scale symmetry is B. We're going to factor it. We're going to square root it. And wrapping axisymmetrically around a single pole. So three dimensions, this thing is a three-dimensional projection, right? But it's going to select out one of those three and say, no, this is, this is how, we're, when we're dividing, we're wrapping around one pole. So the geometry is composed of just the five rotations. But those five rotations at the throat have three things happening to them. They're being split up doubly periodically, right? It has to be a closed system that wraps around on itself eventually, but it's complex now because it's doubly periodic. So it's splitting up in two ways. What's responsible for those two ways of being split? Well, in one case, it's the break and scale symmetry, but also now that we're folding that break and scale symmetry for our balanced system here. And in the other case, it's because we're then wrapping around a pole. So we're making a, a vortex throat. So we're defolding our system and we're wrapping around a pole. And, we ha and, and as we do that, we close a doubly periodic division. And all of this is, being made, is making use of just the five elementary rotations of our division balance. This equation for balance two allows us to define the precise value of this new geometric constant, this second external rotation, with a value of 1.875545967139621 and on and on and on. Now everything else in here I, I assume is, is radically clear, except for the unitary balance of the Weierstrass sigma function. Another way to peer into the rich geometric structure that the Weierstrass constant encodes is to see it in its gamma form. So the Weierstrass constant is defined by the gamma of one half divided by the square of gamma of one half squared times by a double cover, so two to the two n of a hypersphere, collectively under an eight part geometric division. Note that gamma of one half is equal to the square root of pi. So you could swap out the gamma of one half of square root of pi here also, but to see its whole gamma construction this is a good place to start. We can also look at the Weierstrass constant in a more lemniscatic way. For example, the Weierstrass constant can also be defined as the harmonic double cover projection of the n-dimensional hypersphere, internally partitioning in eight divisions, just like we said above. But, all, but now this time we can say maintained under lemniscatic balance, so divided by two square root of two times L, where L is the lemniscate constant, defined from the arc length of the unitary lemniscate. And e to the pi is the volume sum of all even dimensional hyperspheres, which follows from the fact that the equations for the volume and surface areas of n dimensional hyperspheres of radius r are the volume of an n dimensional hypersphere of radius r is equal to pi to the n over 2 divided by gamma of n over 2 plus 1, all times by r to the n. And the surface area of n minus 1 hypersphere of radius r is equal to 2 pi to n over 2 divided by gamma of n over 2 times by r to the n minus 1. Uh, e to the pi is also constructively equal to the limiting sum of the base factorizations. 
So it's pi to the 0 over gamma of 1, plus pi to 1 over gamma of 2, plus pi to 2 over gamma of 3, and on and on and on. As n goes to infinity, this sum defines e to the pi. Or we could rewrite it in terms of factorials, right? Pi to the 0 over 0 factorial, plus pi to the 1 over 1 factorial, plus pi to the 2 over 2 factorial, on and on and on, all the way to pi to the n over n factorial, is equal to e to the pi defining the volume sum of all even-dimensional hyperspheres. This ideal partition balance has a few orthogonal components. That is, alongside the unitary Weierstrass sigma function comes its associated Weierstrass elliptic function with equiharmonic, lemniscatic, and pseudo-lemniscatic half-periods. So not only is the lemniscate constant important in this construction here, but we have omega-1 and omega-2, which define the equiharmonic half-periods, built into this balance. And if we look at it in all of its orthogonal ways, we also have built in the lemniscatic half-periods. So the lemniscate plays a role in one way above. It plays a role again here in two different half-period expressions. It plays a role also in the pseudo-lemniscatic half-periods, which also now constructively well, in, another, in other ways, constructively have this balance with i. So the lemniscate plays a central role, quadruply orthogonal role, in this external balance, because the lemniscate is the inverse curve of the hyperbola with respect to its center. So now that we're outside, the, ins the inside is hyperbolically constructed, right? And the outside first expression, the smallest expression of this one, is where everything gets torn up the most. Here, it's how the, the, the throat divides things up. So the periodicity in this division at the most complex boundary there is going to have all these periods to it. And the periods are all going to be defined in geometric cohort with the lemnus gate itself. Instead of writing balance 2 in terms of the Weierstrass constant or the lemnus gate constant, let's write it in terms of the gamma function to highlight how it's maintained under ideal square split hyperbolic balance. And of course, all the other ways you can you can equally write it are still there. You can still think of it in terms of the Lemniscate constant or the Weierstrass constant. But we're gonna from here on out, I'm gonna pick this this way of writing it in terms of the gamma function, because I want to keep central in our mind the hyperbolic squared split balance of the system. And if we keep that our focus, it's gonna be the simplest way to talk about the balance of the system. So this balance, wh whether we put the Weierstrass constant or the Lemniscate constant or the gamma of one half squared all squared in, in this system or in a way we represent it. It's the same answer, because they're all equal, right? So we can now solve for this, this rotation, the rotation of balance 2, which has a value of 1.875545967139629, and on and on and on. This is another new geometric number, like pi. Okay, and what, is it about? what does it represent geometrically? It represents the external partition rotation maintaining balance 2 in the minimum partition balance of the hyperbolic figure 8 knot. So in the minimum possible constructive geometry, balance of boundary conditions, projecting the minimum possible system, so we'll call that the universe, balance 2 in that system, balance 0, 1, and now 2, the smallest scale balance in the external domain, it has this very specific constructive action to it because it's trying to close, we have to close the whole system against the internal actions, right? So this is the simplest constructive action to define, of course, the throat of the vortex. Okay, it's actually the most complex part. Balance 3 gets even simpler. Um, but before we look, go on to balance 3, now we can plot it. In graph 5, we get the real on the left and imaginary on the right plots of the internal action of balance 2 under dual complex argument. And in graph 6, we have the same internal action of balance 2, but now under inverse complex argument. We put both of them under inverse complex argument. And we get the partition butterfly. Balance 3 defines the opposite end of the hyperbolic vortex, where the external rotations of this division balance circularly close. So we can say that's 2 pi times the, the 5 rotations. While squarely, it doesn't just circularly close, it's balanced internally on something. So it's squarely balancing on the internal circular split division of the hyperbolic figure 8 knot. Externally, there's two circles it splits into. Okay? And this balance has to close that split division. So it's squarely balancing on the circular split division, which is defined as the cosine of b over n, by the way, our break and scale symmetry divided by the five rotations. So that operator is what 
is what we're squarely closing on, and what we're squarely closing to is a circle. Okay, so we have a minimal geometric constructive action on balance three now that allows us to define the exact value of its external rotation of this new geometric number. And its value is 2.176426838175799 on, 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 on. We know what any digit we want from there because it's geometrically defined here. So another number like pi that we add to the list of our geometric elementary descriptors. Okay, this one specifically is the geometric elementary descriptor of the external expression of balance three in the total balance zero, one, two, three, four system of the hyperbolic figure eight knots, minimal trivial partition balance. When we graph the internal action of this balance, balance three, under inverse complex argument, we get a split figure eights. Each figure eight is responsible for the other. So it's a closed split figure eight balance. Graphing this internal action under complex argument instead of inverse complex argument, we see its internal periodicity, the structure it maintains inside. Balance four defines the most external projection of the hyperbolic figure eight knot. The balance point of this external domain, the central scale within boundary four, the, the purple circle. This prescribes the unitary scale of this entire decomposition. This defines the unitary scale of this minimum geometric balance. And this is the scale that's most stably projected. So this five part action has the stability projection point. And as we go in from that stability projection, we, we show or we can describe how the projected sphere internally divides. And that's balance four. But now we need to define boundary four where balance four intersects with balances two and three. Boundary four maintains a union of inverse factors. It's responsible for a few things, right? Boundary four is doing things when it's closing its symmetry. In fact, that's how we're defining all of these things constructively. Well, boundary four is doing three things. One, it's maintaining a union of inverse factors, right? There has to be a union to the split and it's maintaining them. So we're gonna have one over x plus x. Those are two inverse factors. And we're going to maintain their additive union. So both of those components will be present. 1 over x plus x, of course, we can rewrite as e to the log x plus e to the negative log x. But we can also rewrite it as 2 times the hyperbolic cosine of log x. So no matter what x is, two inverse factors that are being additively maintained defines this general hyperbolic logarithmic connection. What else does boundary four do? It squarely joins the internal hyperbolic split division of this balance, which is defined as the hyperbolic cosine of its rotations divided by two, so half of its rotations. It binds this to its external circular split division, which is cosine of b over n. Both of these are squarely arranged jointly with the inverse factor union. So these three geometric actions are maintaining boundary four. It's putting together these three things. It's just geometrically trivially balancing against the split division of our construction. It depends only on the five rotations and the break and scale symmetry of that circular construction those five rotations trivially internally ba are based on. This equation for boundary four now allows us to perfectly characterize to any significant digit we like the value of this external rotation. So the rotation four is a value of 1.4167869859079. On and on and on. When we graph this interaction, it has three components that have arguments, right? So we can put them under triple complex argument and see what their periodic patterning is, this division patterning. Or we can put them in triple inverse complex argument the inverse of boundary four defines the outer edge of action in the cyclically defined universe, the, the other boundary across which no action participating in this balance crosses. By fully decomposing the minimum partition balance, we have mapped the most elemental construction possible. Defining the symmetrically closed balance of actions that compose the simplest possible persistence stage. To explore the intrinsic properties of that stage, Let's look at its boundary conditions. And of course, before we do, let's sum up everything that's been said so far on a single page, now representing the complete partition balance of the hyperbolic figure eight knot. 
all the details filled in. Left side of the equal sign and the right hand side of the equal sign. All the internal balances, all the external balances, with all of the values of the external rotation specified and all of the derangements of each balance specified. This one page, we have just this minimal trivial hyperbolic splitting balance between five different operations under the trivial projection. We've identified all the operations of that balance, right? So this is a, a division splitting balance defining this minimal geometric manifold composed only of hyperbolic and circular components. Chapter 5. The Boundary Conditions of Physical Reality. Now, so far we've only been talking about the minimum geometry, about trying to be more specific about characterizing the the structure built into the minimum possible manifold. And we're imagining this manifold has actually been constructively maintained or um, achieved by some sort of domain. Think of three-dimensional fluid has been twisted and balanced, twisted into this constructive shape and therefore has reached this minimal self-maintaining form. Now that we've specified the different geometric rotational balanced actions of this form, now that we specified the whole division balance that it's predicated on, let's look and see if there's any application in the real world that mimics that sort of balance, because we've constructively defined the simplest possible universe, right? That's, we have a geometry that's the simplest one you could ever expect to be formed from any sort of balance. So now that we have that geometry a little more sharply in our mind, you might immediately wonder, how does this connect to anything in the real world? Does it connect to anything in the real world? Well, with perfect precision, the boundary conditions of the minimum partition balance, the hyperbolic figure eight knot, define the limits of measure in physical reality, the limits of time, space, charge, mass, and temperature, known as the Planck constants. Each external rotation participating in the decomposition balance of the hyperbolic figure eight knot multiplied by a double cover raised to the number of derangements defining each rotation, defines a dimensional boundary of physical reality. The zeroth rotation characterizes the Planck time. The first rotation characterizes the Planck length. The second rotation characterizes the Planck charge. The third rotation characterizes the Planck mass. And the fourth rotation characterizes the Planck temperature. In every single case, the accuracy is perfect within the error bars of our best measurement so far. And perhaps even more excitingly, this entire construction is based off of one simple self-maintained balance. All of these operators require the others. Every single one here is part of a geometry that closes against these other constructive parts. Every single Planck boundary expresses a single part of this minimal construction. This means that the simplest self-balanced geometry intrinsically maintains the coherent system of units that frame reality. The partitioned balance of the hyperbolic figure eight knot defines the boundaries of reality's five fundamental dimensions, time, space, charge, mass, and temperature. This is perhaps the most exciting discovery that can ever be made, that the constructive structure of reality has exact defined geometric boundaries, and that those geometric boundaries explain the Planck constants. We now have boundary conditions for reality. We can geometrically define the boundaries of time, space, charge, mass, and temperature which collectively combine to form the simplest possible self-balanced geometry. In the next video, we will discover that the external facing boundaries of this minimal balance, the Planck charge and Planck mass boundaries, are maintained under hyperbolic vortex connection, and that that connection partitions the Planck charge and Planck mass boundaries into the precise charge and mass assignments that the fundamental particles of matter have. Furthermore, the complete set of balanced intersections maintained within this division balance.
define the constants of nature. That is, this minimal geometric construction externally partitions exactly as we have measured the elemental constructive parameters of our reality do. In short, the complete division parameters of quantum field theory and general relativity are selected out by the boundary conditions that collectively define the simplest possible division geometry and individually define the Planck constants, the literal boundaries of time, space, charge, mass, and temperature.